A finger of land with rugged rocks and sheer cliffs overlooking the currents that collide violently on this corner of the African continent and a nemesis to many sailors over the centuries. A floral kingdom where a World Heritage Site comes to a dramatic end on the very tip of the Cape Peninsula. This is Cape Point, a place unlike anywhere else on this planet. Hello and welcome to the official Cape Point podcast. Over the course of this 12-part series, we'll be exploring this landmark's history and myths. We'll also celebrate the natural beauty of its unique flora and fauna. A paradise for our early Stone Age ancestors who lived here 600,000 years ago. The story of some of the earliest territorial feuds ever fought. The story of Lyme. German spies who fooled a lighthouse keeper or two. The legend of the Flying Dutchman, cursed to never round the Cape of Storms. Indonesian treasures and the fate of a greedy captain. Cape Point shellfish eating baboons, perhaps nature's most chauvinistic animals. The episodes of this podcast can be listened to in any order, so feel free to download them all and listen whenever and wherever you like. Let, Let it begin. begin. Cape of Flames Fires, Feinbos, and fire stick farmers. The oldest Feinbos in the Cape Peninsula. During Cape Town's sweltering summer months, a hot, dry wind blows down the Cape Peninsula. This is the famous Southeaster. It's nicknamed the Cape Doctor because it clears pollution from the inner city as it makes its way across the country. But its journey also sparks wildfires and spreads them through the bush with alarming speed and veracity. The Cape Doctor blows up the coast in a northwesterly direction, so it's heading up and away from Cape Point, blowing wildfires clear of the peninsula. This means that some of the Feinbos in the promontory is the oldest in the Cape Floral Kingdom. There are some bushes on the very tip of Cape Point that are safe from the flames. They are probably the only plants in the park that have never been burned, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Phoenix Feinbos Feinbos is the name given to the vast swathes of scrub and bushes that cover the coastal belt of the Western and Eastern Cape provinces. It's described as both fire-prone and fire-dependent. In other words, Feinbos needs to burn. The fire activates survival tactics in some of the plants and helps them release their seeds. It also enriches the arid soil and clears away the bigger plants so the smaller species can grow. Feinbos adapted to fires during millions of years of natural blazes caused by lightning and sparks from falling boulders. The plants have evolved, creating a number of interesting techniques to survive fires. Some have developed seed storage cones that only release seeds after they burn. Others have thick bark which insulates them from fires, or roots and bulbs that stay protected underground and then regrow. Journalist Nechama Brody writes in the Cape Town book. In other plants, fire stimulates the germination of dormant seeds buried in the ground, either by desiccating or rupturing their extremely hard outer coats, allowing water to enter. Incredibly, some species of Feinbos even respond to the chemicals released by plant-derived smoke, which stimulates seed germination. It's also believed that some of the earliest humans to live on the Cape Peninsula deliberately set fire to the Feinbos to increase its potential as food. Wildfires Ideally, the Feinbos burns every 15 years or so. Because Feinbos is quite fine, it doesn't burn at very high temperatures. The Cape, however, is home to several invasive alien species. Plants like the Port Jackson traveled here by ship, and others were deliberately planted by gardeners. These burn longer and more intensely than is natural for the Feinbos. The spread of the city's suburbs means that man-made fires are also increasingly a problem. The Cape Peninsula is no stranger to fires. In 2001, a wildfire spread across 8,000 hectares, destroying eight houses and causing 30 million rands worth of damage. Another fire started in the mountains above Cork Bay in 2015. It spread and spread until 5,000 hectares between False Bay, Nurtuk, Hart Bay and Constantia had been consumed in its wake. 
The last big fire at Cape Point was in 1991. It's believed to have been an accident, probably caused by a careless tourist, but it devoured about a third of the park. Fighting fire. It was 11 a.m. when Dean Harrison's team got the call. They were working in Sakai, battling the huge Cape fire on March 2015. It had started in the mountains above Musenberg and soon spread as far as Constantia and Chapman's Peak. A team of 10 brave souls had been at it for four days in a row, grinding out 12-hour shifts in the crucible of smoke and heat. By the time the call came through from the headquarters, they were exhausted. Firefighting is a hellishly difficult labor of love. Dean Harrison and his team are all volunteers with a group called Volunteer Wildfire Services. VWS works alongside other civic organizations, including Sandparks, dedicated fire crews, and the provincial and municipal fire fighting units. Most wildfires start in summer, when temperatures can reach 37 degrees centigrade. The firefighters wear full protective gear and carry heavy equipment. They have to hike for hours, up steep slopes just to get to the roaring infernos, which is where the hard and dangerous work really begins. But there's a particular kind of strength that people harness when they're working for a purpose that transcends their individual selves. So when Dean was told to stop his team's operation in Takai and attend to a fire that had flared up in Cape Point, there was no question of whether he could make it or not. Only when. Dean's instincts told him there was something strange about a fire starting in Cape Point. For days, the wind had been blowing intensely from the southeast sending any potential ashes away from the park. So how could a fire spontaneously start in the western flank of the park? The answer was unusual for this time of year. Lightning. It might sound unlikely in dry, sunny weather, with howling gale force winds and not a cloud in sight. But the entire Cape Peninsula had been engulfed in flames for two weeks, and the accumulated smoke became a conductor for the highly charged atmosphere. In these conditions, freak lightning bolts become a distinct probability. It was a cruel twist of fate wrapped in a smoky cloak of physics. By the time Dean and his crew arrived, there were already a couple of Sandparks teams on the scene and two water tankers. Firefighting helicopters were dropping containers of water from overhead. They rushed to the briefing area where they found Clinton Dolgy, the operations section chief, and one of the volunteer wildfire services founders. He told Dean that his team would be approaching the blaze from the left flank. As Dean led his crew into the Fainbosen bush, Dolji called out to him. Hey, Dean. Dean turned around and Dolji said, Let's show these guys how we chase ahead. Colin Dolji was referring to the fact that firefighters approach the fire from its base, downwind. So chasing the hedge means slowly working your way up towards the core of the flames. The volunteers are split into two groups. Those at the front are armed with beaters, large rubber flaps that beat out the flames. They're followed by a group equipped with rakos, which secure the coals and ashes that the beaters leave in their wake, preventing further flare-ups. For the rest of the day, Dean's team labored to contain the flames. The beaters at the top would regularly spool back so that no single person spent too long on the dangerous front line closest to the flames. Smoke inhalation and exhaustion are constant dangers in these situations. Dean's team had covered about a kilometer and a half of vast distance under the circumstances when the team behind them called out. There had been another flare up in their wake. They went back to the start all over again. By the end of the day, the firefighters had the blaze under control. Dean and his colleagues stumbled home to cold showers, lightheaded and nauseous, and fell into bed. The following morning, Dean's lungs ached almost as much as his arms and legs. He craved biltong and energy drinks. His body needed to replace the salt and electrolytes he had sweated out. Dean's phone pinged. There had been another flare-up at Cape Point, three times as big as the day before. He didn't hesitate. I'm on my way. Prescribed fires in Cape Point. The game ranges at the Cape of Good Hope section of Table Mountain National Park occasionally start prescribed burns to help the plants grow. The game ranges at Cape Point were planning a prescribed fire in the reserve in 2015, but the massive wildfire in Cork Bay in the same year meant the resources necessary to control the fire were otherwise engaged, so it couldn't happen. Instead, a prescribed burn took place in 2016. Any fire plan needs to take alien species into account as much of the Feinbosch itself 
because alien species burn much hotter and longer. This is also partly why separating alien vegetation from fanbos is so important. The trick is to burn the fanbos slowly and thoroughly, and in order to do that, the rangers need to wait for specific conditions. The wind can't be too strong, and it has to be blowing in the right direction. This is tricky. It's not often that one gets a mild southeaster, especially at Cape Point. When it does occur, most of the park's resources are deployed to guard the reserve's infrastructure. The park's game rangers and staff are helped by firefighters and wardens. The entire operation usually doesn't take more than 24 hours. If you happen to visit the park sometime after these controlled burns and see the blackened landscape, don't despair. It's natural. If you look closely, you might see fresh little shoots from newer fanbos emerging from the ashes. That's it for this episode of the official Cape Point podcast. We hope you have a chance to visit this dramatic corner of the African continent sometime soon and to experience the scenic beauty which surrounds this idyllic piece of land. You can explore one of the many trails across craggy cliffs to hidden beaches or ride the funicular and visit the old lighthouse. There are also free audio tours to enjoy at your own pace. Just download the Voice Map app and install the Cape Point audio tour. It's best to do this before you visit as cell phone signal is unpredictable. To find out more about Cape Point, visit www.capepoint.co.za.